Hello everybody, you see the horsey over here? Recently won the best tactics course of the year award on Chessable. So I just hanged it next to the Raven. Thank you so much for taking your time and voting for that course. I really appreciate all of your support. And also from the Chessable community, obviously. I'm so happy that this course, which I gave so much of my energy and effort to create, has been appreciated by the community. Please go and check this course. It's on a sale for next week. And well, I mean, Raven is so beautiful, right? I just couldn't remove the Raven, so I have to compromise. My wife had to agree that I can finally hang this horsey next to Raven. But now I have to shift everything, my, my chair, my table, to show them both to you guys. So please give me feedback. Do you rather see the Raven or horsey or both? How can I fix this problem of sitting like this in a crooked position? Anyways, at least for today, I would like to have this angle to really give a shout out to that course, Fundamental Chess Calculation Skills. Today, folks, I'm starting a new series on Instructive Chess Classics. I truly believe in the value of studying classics, but modern games are so complex, so chaotic, right? So we have to find those games, ideally, that there was a difference between the skill level so you can see how a master is playing out those positions against slightly lower rated players so we can see the plans in a nicer way we can understand tons of things from such classical games so recently i started a quest in finding those instructive games played by the world champions so my idea for this series is this i will show you a game of a world champion against a lower rated opponent I can probably show you only one game at a time, although you can give me feedback, maybe I can show you more games per video, but we'll go deep in that game and we'll really, really try to dis distill the lessons, instruct the lessons we can take from those games. Okay, folks, please give me feedback on YouTube on how you like this series. Today, I'm starting with a game of Gary Kasparov that he played with the Black Pieces against Silvio Danilo, who later ended up being a manager of Veselin Topalov, okay? So this game was played in 1980 already, in under 20 World Championship. Gary was only 17 years old, but there was already a skill difference. Gary's rating was 2,595 at that age versus Danilov's rating of 2,295. Yeah, 300 rating difference. And this game shows us, first of all, that exchanging blindly is not going to help you when you're playing against a higher rated opponent, and we'll see how Gary Kasparov punished him with such blind exchanges. Okay, so that's a King's Indian classic, King's Indian classic endgame. So if you're a King's Indian player, that will be even more interesting for you to pay attention to those motifs that you can outplay people even in deep endgames. Okay, so Gary obviously was a great King's Indian player. He chooses that setup with e5, obviously. So far, we are following theory, obviously. And after DE, you see there's already the first exchange. White player, he goes for this exchange variation of the King's Indian, hoping that it will give him better chances to save a draw against Gary Kasparov. Obviously, you can also play for more ambitious aims. It's not such a terrible idea to play like this with white. But the remaining moves, I think, clearly shows us the mindset of white player. He blindly wants to exchange pieces. Here, knight d7 was chosen. The theoretical move is rook e8 these days, unpinning the knight and defending that pawn and keeping the tension. Okay? And Gary goes knight d7, by the way. And white player immediately jumps and seeks further exchanges. That's already very interesting, guys. Please follow this. White welcomes peace trades. And now we'll see. For example, long castle will be better. Again, keeping the tension, pinning that knight. And developing a rook. That will be a better choice for white. But he lashes out with knight d5 directly. Interesting, right? And now Gary, of course, there was a pressure on the c7 pawn. He chases that knight away. He says, okay, come, show me what you want. And white player wants to trade off that bishop as well. And now we end up in this endgame, which is very, very interesting, folks. We can maybe start our discussion after Castle Long, which was chosen in the game. Right, like I want you to take a step back right now and just ask yourself what's going on here, right? How do you evaluate a position like this? And to my mind, what's the most thematic here is those two pawns, right? E4 and C4 versus this setup. 
That's a very typical King's Indian pawn structure, right? What are the benefits and drawbacks of such setup for white, you might ask yourself, right? Yes, you have better control of some central squares, but the c6 pawn is single-handedly, right? Covering that d5 square. In fact, by pushing e4 and d4, e4 and c4, white already created some weaknesses on those dark squares, right? You can see d4 has become a strong square for black pieces. c5 square is also a nice spot for the, for the knight, for example, right? I'm just talking about potential drawbacks of this setup for white. Plus, this bishop is not a good piece, folks. Please watch this out. This bishop is a bad piece in this pawn structure. So yes, white has the bishop pair. And yes, white has the unopposed light square bishop, right? Black has no light square bishop now. Despite that, this is not an advantage for white because there are so many pawns in the center that are blocking this piece, okay? Interesting, right? All these things are great for you. If you want to take this opening with black, all these evaluations in certain end games are interesting. Black has a knight pair, as uh, and this knight is potential, as I mentioned, right? This knight can jump to c5, later on maybe e6 to d4. This piece has potential. And that's exactly how Gary starts outplaying the white player here. First, he goes knight c5. He immediately puts pressure, right, on that e4 pawn. And he's actually welcoming knight takes e5 because that will already activate the bishop on g7. So again, white player makes another mistake here, folks. He sees that this pawn is hanging. So he goes for one more exchange. One more exchange. He exchanges off the bishop as well. But that was white's good bishop, right? Like going back, this piece was your good bishop. This was your bad bishop. So again, just one more trade that ultimately will favor black in this position. Again, white has left himself with a single bishop now. That's a colorblind creature, and that's a bad bishop in this pawn structure. You might say this bishop is also bad, but Gary will show us the way to improve that piece. And that's why this game is very instructive, folks, to watch. Here, just follow Gary's dark square play and see how he gradually improves his pieces and starts outplaying white from this position, right? On the surface, it looks like, okay, with every piece trade, white is maybe coming closer to a draw. But Gary says it's far from it. First, he starts to stabilize this knight on c5. How do you stabilize this piece, folks? That's a very typical King's Indian motif. Yes, you're a great player if you found the move a5. a5 stabilizes the knight on c5 because now white can no longer play b4. That becomes impossible for white to play b4, and now this knight is much happier. Obviously, we're never gonna take that bishop, right? Like, please, no chess crimes, please. That bishop is a bad piece, right? And our knight has potential. That's why Gary keeps the knight on the board. Rook e1, and now a4 is also a good move, guys, here, by the way. But Gary starts with this move first. Why? Because Gary is forming a plan. He wants to defend this pawn for the moment with the rook, right? Because there was some pressure on that pawn so that this bishop will be free. And can you already tell me, guys, what's the destination of that piece? White player played bishop f1. That was a mistake. Bishop c2 would be a more prudent move, controlling that knight on c5. Bishop f1 is a big mistake, actually. And here, please, if my question to you is this, how do you improve your worst place piece, right? That bishop is a bad piece. Can you see an improvement? You're a great player, folks, if you found the move bishop d8. Gary is forming a plan. He says maybe the bishop will go to b6 or, as the game continuation shows us, can you guess black's next move, Fox? Yes, a4. He goes a4 and he wants to activate this bishop like this. Beautiful. That's how he slowly outplays his lower-rated opponent, right? Grandmasters, strong players, they actually welcome endgames. They welcome endgames as a quiet position that they can show their strength of evaluation, slow maneuvering, and every single piece gets active, right? White has zero counterplay. King c2, bishop a5, bam! This bad bishop turns out to be a great piece on that long diagonal, and now the rook has to go here, and those rooks are split, right? So we actually manage to split those rooks, and the moment this happens, Gary goes, this is the worst place piece, how do you activate it? Yes, rook d8, obviously, right? Our rooks are connected, their rooks are not connected, thus 
he actually welcomes this trade just in the right time because why if white takes right now right which he basically does then black is the one who is taking over the only open file can you see how a master played this segment folks that's very in instructive to me right he never actually offered a trade he never offered a trade directly right many of the amateur players will go here rook d8 hey i want to take over the open file gary says you know what this rook is not dangerous because this knight is taking away the entry square and here that's a very instructive moment guys Open file looks beautiful for white, but it's useless because there is no entry point for those rooks, right? Be look at our beautiful knight on c5. So Gary doesn't welcome blind exchanges, which are only favoring white. He first splits those rooks, instructive, and then goes rook d8. Beautiful. That's how you play good positional chess, folks. That's how you outplay people, positionally speaking, right? Takes, takes. And now... The rook is beautiful, the knight is beautiful, the bishop is beautiful. And look at this. Look at the white pieces here, guys. This knight is tied down in defending against rook d2, right? You see, white pieces are already getting tied down in this position. Terrible bishop. Look at this bishop. A terrible piece. Terrible knight. Only defensive function. And even this rook is terrible. So again, it's a symmetrical pawn structure. It's an endgame. On the surface, it looks like white has no problems. But now you start comparing those pieces, compare the piece activity between white and black, and that shows us a very, very different picture, right? And here OD black is a large advantage, folks. So, white player didn't take on e5 because that will allow a rook on the second rank, then I will take on f2, I will attack everything, it just looks unplayable for white. So he played bishop h3 here, folks. He wants to make use of the bishop somehow, but you see, the bishop has no targets. Just shooting in the empty space, basically. And uh, here, Gary just makes a calm move, right? Very, very calm move. I defend my pawn in a very minimal way. So you have no counterplay whatsoever. And again, look at your pieces. And now we are coming to a very interesting point. Rook e2, he has to guard the d2 square with the rook, but this rook is passive, right? Active rook and passive rook. And Gary here looks at the king, right? The worst place piece. And he just makes a very natural move. King is seven, right? Every single piece is coming and playing in this end game for black. And black already is a large advantage. It's already almost like a Zugzwang, folks. You can see it. He went back to g2 with the bishop because he's almost have no constructive moves left in this position with white. And now comes Gary's next beautiful maneuver, guys. I found this next phase so instructive. How do you improve your position with black? Yeah, that's a key question. It looks like your pieces reach their maximum potential. So how do you improve from here? Gary finds a beautiful improving idea, folks. Maybe you can stop the video here and first of all, think for yourself. Tell me an idea, like a small positional idea of a small improvement for black in this position. You're a great player, folks, if you came up with the move knight d3. It's a beautiful idea, but the real point is this. First things first, I want to go knight b4, and if you go king b1 to defend your pawn, then comes rook d1 check. Can you see it, guys? That's the immediate threat that is presented by knight d3. The knight becomes an octopus piece. That's a great piece, obviously. And there is no drawback to this move. Yeah? You cannot play rook d2 to pin my knight. And uh, I'm also stopping moves like this, for example, right? So... Having seen this knight b4 idea, white player went a3. And Gary says, you know what? Pawn moves are committal. By playing a3, you gave away the b3 outpost, and he just goes back at knight c5. Beautiful, guys. He basically jumps to d3 just to induce this move a3. He just comes back. Look at this pendulum. Look at this patience. Look at this logical segment that white is no counterplay, so he induces a little weakness with a3 in this position. Suddenly, this knight gained access to b3. From b3, he will first of all eye the d2 square, but also, right, very importantly, this d4 outpost will be available to the knight. Just look at the beautiful segment here, folks. That's how masters play, right? He wants to induce a little target, and he makes a small improvement. That's a nice mini plan. Gary doesn't calculate 10 moves ahead. He knows that this infliction of this a3 move will serve him right that's a beautiful outplaying endgame folks h4 white is no moves left 
Gary just calls h5, stops all kind of h5 ideas in the position. Okay? And white goes, well, white goes rook e3 here. White goes rook e3 because it's almost, again, almost like no moves left in this position. Right? Every single piece is paralyzed. So here, again, guys, I want you to take a step back. Please stop the video. And how would you find that finishing blow? It's about creating the second weakness in the position. Okay? We know that white's already having the first weakness, right? This knight is paralyzed. All of their pieces are tied down. This bishop is a buried piece. So he's already having the first weakness in the position. His pieces are on the back foot, you see. But a single weakness is not enough to win the game. You need to create the second front in this position. How would you do that, folks? I will give you the first prompt. The problem piece is the knight on f3, right? This knight is paralyzed in defending against rook d2. Is there a way for us to start disturbing that knight from f3? That's the key question. Yes. Once you ask yourself this question, you find Gary's move g5. What a beautiful move, folks. He basically says, you know what? My pawn is about to reach e4. I will kick your knight from that spot. And then I will basically go in and invade the second rank. Notice also that this knight is fighting against this d4 outpost. So even after that, knight b3 to d4 ideas becomes available to black, right? So this knight was the key defender of those weaknesses. And g5 basically makes sure that this knight has to go away. Beautiful. Final blow takes takes. White can take either of these pawns with knight. But since knight is paralyzed and tied down, both options are terrible for white. He played rook e2 in the actual game. But let's, for example, look at knight takes g5. What should black do here, folks? I made a video about this recently. The Einstellung effect. Einstellung effect would prevent you in finding the best move in the position, which is bishop d2, right? Look at this. Because we humans, we look at the move rook d2 first, right? Obviously, this comes as a natural candidate. This is also, of course, great move for black. But this is even nicer because black is winning material directly. And the game is over, folks. Okay? So after h takes, f takes, he couldn't take on g5. If he takes on e5, again, the problem is this. I invade the second rank and I take on f2. Or I can even start with this move first. It doesn't really matter. And then I take on f2. Look at this bishop, right? Now the bishop is running short of squares. <laughs> Talking about problems in the white position. And after bishop h3, can you tell me the fork? Obviously, right? g4 and black wins material. Amazing. So after h takes g5, f takes g5, well, white is helpless. He played rook e2 in this position just to be able to guard that d2 square. But then comes Gary's next move. A very simple move indeed. Knight b3. And the knight starts eyeing that d4 outpost. I told you about that outpost before, guys. And now, again, the knight cannot capture because that knight is tied down in defending that square, right? Again, talking about active pieces and passive and terrible pieces. And that makes the whole difference. We are coming to an end. He played king b1 and Gary made the simplest move in the position. Simplest move, king f6. I'm defending my pawns. And again, you're in a Zugzwang position in this position with the white pieces. Nothing you can do can save you. And here actually, he resigned after, after this. After this one, we just resigned. We can look at king c2, g4, right? And now knight d4, fork will decide the game. So you cannot just go back to king c2. What else can white do in this position? Are you seeing anything else? Maybe knight h2 to go back. But then comes rook d1 check, folks. And then rook g1. Look at this bishop, guys. <laughs> Look at this bishop. Obviously, playing rook d1 first was good because we forced king c2. And now knight d4 is a second threat. That's the first threat, obviously. And things are collapsing for white. Knight d4. And the game is over. Folks, that's an amazing game right we can go back to the beginning and just very briefly let's take some lessons from this instructive game that's a very clean end game display from gary kasparo and mindset of the white player was very interesting he just basically tries to exchange everything but then we learn right in the king's indian this end game things are not so easy white is no easy way out by trading everything. This looks like an okay endgame for white. Bishop pair, right? More space, let's say. But then you see, right, those weaknesses in the position. And you see that black can outplay the white players in this endgame. In fact, I have a couple of friends who are King's Indian experts. They won so many games from such 
kinks in the end games, folks. And that's the final function of studying such model games, because right then you're forming connections. Chess expertise mostly relies on pattern recognition, and this game is definitely giving you so many patterns. For example, a typical pattern is a5. This repeats itself in the king's Indian, right? You have a beautiful knight and you're stopping all kind of b4 shenanigans and you cement your knight on that square and together with the bat bishop on d3, you basically start outplaying people. Another king's Indian pattern is coming here, folks. You know it, right? Bishop d8, obviously. Another typical king's Indian pattern. This bishop is becoming a great piece after a4 and bishop a5. So that's also why I chose this game because, right, in a single game, it's a multi-purpose game. We can learn so many nice motifs in this defense, King's Indian defense for black. And again, timing of rook exchange is perfect, right? Again, keeping the tension, waiting for the right moment to exchange, never go for blind piece trades, right? Master never blindly exchange pieces. There's always some logic behind their piece trades. And then we end up in this end game where black has great pieces, Black has time to improve, while white has no improving plans. White has to wait, basically, until black creates the second front. And this is the beautiful part. Inflicting a3, right? Inflicting a3, and then going back to c5. Incredible, right? Because now the knight has access to this b3 square. Stopping all kind of h5 ideas. And here comes the final blow. Creating the second front of g5 and infiltrating to white's position, folks. I found this, this game one of the best and cleanest and the most instructive games in chess history, actually. Also, in terms of real championship classics, right? The classics of the real champions. And I hope you agree with me, folks, that this game gives us joy and satisfaction. And lessons is obviously, right? You have no easy way out. When you're playing against high rate of players, right? Blindly exchanging pieces won't help you. You have to use your mind. You have to play against the pieces and not against the opponent, right? You have to treat the chess principles correctly. You cannot just rely on simplifications, basically. That's actually only helping the high-rated player, because as you can see in this endgame, right? Gary basically grinds down this endgame with zero counterplay for white. In fact, if you want to beat high-rated players, generally, you should seek chaotic positions that they cannot rely on their patterns, right? Chaos on the board, crazy complications, calculations, and basically irrational positions that should be your goal most of the time. Please give me feedback, folks, about this beautiful game. Do you like this series idea? What other concepts do you want to touch in this? Maybe we can list those lessons, like I can show you some PowerPoint slides in the end. Just let me know about the structure of this series. I'm very excited about this. I think it's really beneficial for learning and accumulation of those patterns. And uh, I will catch you on the next episode with another world champion. If you like this video, please give me a like and subscribe. That's very important for me to be able to produce similar content. And again, we should give a shout out to Fundamental Chess Calculation Skills that won the best tactics course of the year on Chessable. I'm thanking you again for your votes, for your support for me personally. And let me know, do you want to see the Raven and the Horsey at the same time or should I shift? I mean, just let me know basically what kind of... Uh, creatures do you want to see? I like both of them and um, I don't know, but I'm, I'm in a crooked position right now. I don't know exactly how to solve this problem. And um, anyways, we'll come back to it soon, guys. I am wishing you all the best in your chess journey and I will catch you again very soon. Bye-bye.